Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you very much for being here. More people will be coming in. Um, our worship liturgy at 9 went a little long, but I'm really thrilled that you're here. I'm very excited about both speakers this morning and what's coming up, I think, on April 22nd at Caltech, right? April 22nd. And we want you to know about it as a result of being here, and we want you to take this publicity um, card with you so that you can help us spread the word uh, about this very, very important um, event. Um, I'm reminded when we we're talking about this particular issue today, uh, our brother William Sloan Coffin said that um, we are at a state in our world where uh, the smallest unit of survival is not the individual or any group, but the entire human race. And that is certainly the case when it comes to global warming. So we're really quite thrilled to have both the playwright and also the actor who will be performing um, this one person show at Caltech uh, this coming month. Just a, words, a few words of introduction. Uh, first about Mike Farrell. Mike Farrell is a friend of long standing of All Saints Church, both George Regas and me. He is a, a thrilling and inspiring human being who has, um, is best known for his role as B.J. Honeycutt on the television series MASH. He later produced the film Patch Adams, starring Robin Williams, and starred on the television series Providence. He also appeared as Milton Lang on Desperate Housewives. Mike most recently appeared on stage in On Golden Pond and Terry Haute. Um, and uh, he is no stranger to the one-person biographical roles, having portrayed Clarence Darrow as well as John F. Kennedy. He's a longtime activist for political causes, campaigning vigorously against the death penalty. He's the founder of Death Penalty Focus, which is a partner of All Saints Church in our fight against the death penalty. And he's also spoken out on behalf of animal rights and against human rights abuses in the US, Latin America, and the Middle East. He also was a, a deep friend of John O'Donohue, who is uh, kind of a soulmate of ours and uh, has some wonderful stories to tell about John, but that's not why he's here this morning. Speaking of Mike Farrell's political activism, I failed to say that for those of you who were not in church, we have an action table that is available to you. Please, today's action is against solitary confinement, which I consider to be torture. And we're trying to clean up some loopholes at Pelican Bay, which allow people to throw our brothers into solitary confinement on um, kind of trumped up charges. So please stop by the action table and take a stand. We're also thrilled that George Shea is with us. George worships at All Saints Church with his wife, Martha Stevens. He's an environmental journalist and activist whose other plays have been produced um, throughout the states. He, his work has appeared on NPR's All Things Considered. He's the author of many children's books, including a biography of Rachel Carson. And during the summer of 2011, he was arrested outside the White House with Bill McKibben, Dr. James Hansen and 1,250 other activists pro protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. We are thrilled to have both of these brothers with us, and I think first up to the podium is Mike Farrell. Will you help me please warmly welcome our friend, Mike Farrell. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you uh, all. Thank you, Ed, for that uh, warm introduction. And <laughs> reciting my credits is always fun to listen to. Sure. <laughs> I, uh, but since you mentioned it, I just will have to add a plug. Uh, uh, April 15th, uh, Death Penalty Focus, the organization I chair, is having a dinner in uh, West Los Angeles, or in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, for those of you who are interested. Um, and one of the people we're honoring is um, Juan Mendez, the former, or the current um, UN Special Rapporteur, as they call it, for uh, torture. Uh, Juan has uh, is the one who has led the way about on the issue of uh, solitary confinement. He says solitary confinement 
for a period of ex exceeding 15 days begins to cause mental decompensation. And we are, have people in this country who have been under solitary confinement for decades. So it's, it's important for us to know about this issue. Um, forgive me for digressing. Um, I, I am here because of this man. Um, uh, three, th three, three, three years ago, or s about, um, I was uh, outside bringing my trash cans in, and um, this fellow walked up to me. We had not met, but he reminded me that his wife uh, works with me on a, uh, or has had worked with me on a, uh, a local uh, uh, community organization, and uh, asked me. Started talking about a play. He thought he had an idea for a one-man play. And I said, well, that's interesting, and it's all about this particular scientist. And um, I said, well, that sounds interesting, but I said, how, do you, how does it become a play and not a lecture? And he said, well, you know, I think I can do it. So I said, well, great. And he said, if, if you're agreeable, I'll go sit down and write it. And I said, terrific. So months later, I got this <clears throat> document from him, and I, I called him back, and I said, well, this is very interesting. I mean, great stuff, but it's not a play. It's a lecture. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, let me fix that. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he went back and, and fixed it. <clears throat> and uh, then uh, I was very moved by the, the information particularly, but about the, the hero heroism of this man, David Keeling, Charles David Keeling, um, a scientist, um, that George was able to put into a format that, um, that has become this uh, one-person play that uh, Ed talks about, uh, Dr. Keeling's Curve. Um, and we've done it now through different kind of uh, uh, process, uh, uh, transmogrifications. I don't know. We, we keep it, it keeps uh, because of the changes in the experience of that we're all subject to. Uh, the, the the play changes because of uh, uh, events that have developed in the ensuing period. Um, the play changes, but it it remains the same. It's a story of this man, this quite extraordinary man who stumbled into an area because of his love of nature and science. The combination of doing science in nature was always something that fascinated him. And because of that, he, he made quite extraordinary discoveries that have led to an understanding of what is happening in our, in our world today. Um, and I, I saw, I don't know if some of you may know the name Joe Rahm. Uh, Joe is a climate, one of the leading climate climatologists, climate scientists in the, in the world. And he wrote an article that just has some really quick things that uh, I want to write, uh, cite to you before we talk about the play itself. Um, he said, we, we are at the risk of pushing our climate system toward abrupt, unpredictable, and potentially irreversible changes. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has joined with the IPCC in saying that we are in danger. We, civilization, is in danger as a result of the potential um, uh, results of, of climate change. Uh, and it is certain, from the point of view of 97% of the scientists in the world, climate scientists in the world, it is certain that humans are responsible for the most recent climate change. Um, that is, of course, denied by significant people around the world, but mostly in this country, who have a vested interest in maintaining our society as it currently operates, most of which is based on dependence on fossil fuel, which is the great contributor to CO2 emissions and therefore climate change. Um, he says, the science linking human activities to climate change is analogous to the science linking smoking to lung and cardiovascular disease. George has done a wonderful job of incorporating so much information into this play that it kind of unmasks the, um, the people who are on the other side of this issue, the deniers who are being so successful in getting out to the people of the United States in particular, the, all of this stuff debunking the notion that there is such a thing as climate change, that there is such a thing as global warming. But I, I just wanted you to hear from this man, this uh, Joe Rahm, because what he's saying is, is er, that it is urgently important, urgently important, that we begin to do something immediately, we as a society. And that means you, and it means me, and it means our government, too, that we begin to activate ourselves. Now, <clears throat> 
without doing the play for you, which I'd be happy to do, but uh, we don't have the time. Um, I, want to, I want to introduce George, who will have a few things to say. And I want to, um, uh, I want to simply ask you to think very seriously about what it is you can do, each of us can do, to bring people's awareness to a point where they begin to take seriously the idea that we must find a way to, um, to gener generate the enthusiasm of people towards saving our society, saving the world as we know it. Because um, the, one, one of the things he says here, I just want to, I don't want to go on uh, terribly about what he said, but he said, uh, scientists tend to be a stolid group. We're not given to the theatrical rantings about falling skies. We're more comfortable in our laboratories. But the answer to the question being posed today is that we, the scientists of the world that know about climatology, virtually all of us are now convinced that global warming poses a clear and present danger to our civilization, to the civilization as we know it today. And there's a, there's a point that George makes in the play that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save for the end because it's, um, it, it's a profound thought that, um, that I believe we all have to kind of take into consideration. But uh, let me, um, uh, without, uh, oh, I want to add one thing. Tom Steyer is a name some of you know. Tom spoke here. I met him a night before last, and we had quite a conversation about the play and about the work he's doing. And I said I was going to be speaking here this morning, and he said, All Saints, what a great place. He said, <laughs> he said the people of All Saints, they're the best. Well, he said, maybe it's Grace Church. Well, between Grace Church and All Saints, you got the best place. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, but it was a great endorsement of you folks and, and Ed and, and the, uh, the activism of, of the people in this community, and I thank you for that. Um, let me now introduce a man I have great respect for, the author of the play, uh, George Shea. I, I have a, a lot of respect, of course, for Mike Farrell and a lot of gratitude um, I, I first learned about global warming. It, the year was 1988, and uh, I was doing an interview with Kurt Vonnegut uh, for an in-flight magazine, of all things, right? And uh, he was chain-smoking all through it and coughing and wheezing, you know? And at the end of it, he started talking about global warming. And I said, what? What's that? And he explained it to me. And of course, Vonnegut did have an apocalyptic vision of a lot of things. I mean, he, he was in Dresden the day they you know, burned the city down, pretty much. That was what Slaughterhouse-Five was about. But, um, and finally he said, uh, but you know, there's no need, don't, don't, no need to print this, you know? You don't want to upset your readers, you know? Uh, I mean, the planet's doomed anyway. We haven't got a chance, you know? We'll just run out of oxygen. And he took another puff on his cigarette, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but he, he upset me, he upset me a lot. And I, I started asking around, you know, because I, I was doing a lot of magazine writing at that time, and you ask five or six people, and they'll eventually point you to the person who gives you 80% of your story. And I got a hold of Lester Brown, who was running World Watch at that time. And, um, you know, Lester painted the picture for me, he said, if, if, we do, if we let it get out of control, we're just going to have emergencies all the time. Floods, fires, uh, terrible drought. People won't be able to grow food. And a lot of it in third world countries is going to lead to civil wars and uprisings and civil strife and uh, hundreds of millions of refugees. It's going to be a, a, just a terrible mess. And it actually could could get out of control where we just couldn't stop it. And so I asked him, I said, uh, you know, is there anything we can do? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, if, if the nations of the world make the kind of effort that the Allies made to win World War II, uh, we, might, we might, yeah, we could probably stop it. And of course that didn't happen. Uh, the 1990s came and went, and then George Bush got elected in 2000, and so on. 
Uh, and of course, it still hasn't happened. And this, um, much later on, uh, I remember I was reading a, a Tom Friedman column on the subject of global warming. This was a few years ago. And he said, you know, there seems to be so much confusion about it. What if uh, a group of, you know, first-rate scientists got together and put out uh, a 20-page statement that any sixth grader could understand, you know, explaining what it's all about? It's a great idea, you know. I'd written a bunch of children's books, so I started doing some research, and the name Keeling kept coming up. David Keeling, Charles David Keeling, who um, came up with the Keeling Curve, which is, of course, what the play is all about. Mike plays uh, Charles David Keeling. I, uh, I, I realized a children's book probably wouldn't do it. Um, I began to think, maybe this should be a play. Because yeah? I'd written one-man plays before about science. And um, one day I was walking around Studio City with my wife, Martha. She's sitting back there. And um, it, was, it was kind of it was January day, about three years ago, kind of rainy. And uh, Martha said, oh, that's, that's uh, Mike Farrell's house. I said, oh, really? Huh. And then she went off somewhere. And anyway, I, I saw Mike taking out his garbage. And I thought, maybe God wants me to do this, you know? <laughs> So I ran up to him. I said, hey, Mike, how do you feel about global warming? And he said, oh, I think it's a real problem. My goodness, yeah. Anyway, so we talked for about five minutes, and that started it. I told him I'd send him some pages. And he's already told you the story of how we created the play. Um, we did workshop it that summer. Uh, we did a, a, a run in September and October at the Blank Theater. And uh, then we did it at USC last year. And again, we're doing it uh, at Caltech on Earth Day, uh, April 22nd, 8 o'clock. It's, um, boy, I could go on and on. Uh, I know Mike is the main attraction, <laughs> but uh, people ask me, uh, hmm, well, obviously, we've got to cut back on CO2. And it's getting awfully late. It really is. I. Uh, I was, at, uh, I was in New York last spring. I spent a couple of hours at Columbia with Klaus Lochner, who's a scientist there. Lochner has a system to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The research money isn't there to really develop it. You know, It could be done. It would be incredibly expensive, and it would take many, many years, maybe 50 or 100 years, but it could be done. Um, anyway, I had, I had lunch with Spencer Weert, who's probably the leading science historian on the planet. Uh, he wrote The Discovery of Global Warming, and we've exchanged about 100 emails. He's read the play many times. <laughs> he keeps pointing, you know, I, I keep checking it for mistakes, and he'll let me know. But um, he said that, uh, I said, well, well Spencer, when, when do you think it's really going to hit the fan, you know, with... Uh, with the CO2, and he said, well, I'll tell you, uh, I'd say around the late 2020s, uh, it's going to become so painfully obvious that something is horribly wrong, that even the most diehard uh, climate denier is going to throw in the towel and admit that we've we got to deal with it. And I just, I just hope it isn't too late. So let's hope it isn't too late. Um, we just really have to make a tremendous effort. And that's, that's what motivated the play. And I'm so grateful again to Mike Farrell, who really has done a terrific job of bringing it to life. And I hope, uh, hope a whole bunch of you can uh, join us on Earth Day, April 22nd at Caltech, 8 o'clock. Uh, there's some um, leaflets, whatever, postcards, big postcards explaining about the play and how to get a ticket and all that good stuff. So I'm going to bring you back to Mike here. Thank you. I think
Because the time is short and I want to allow for some questions, let me just say a couple of things. The genius that George, I think, has brought to this story is that it's the story of, of a man. It's not just somebody saying doom is coming. Um, it, it's a story of a human being, like all of us, who kind of got into a, uh, a, uh, an approach to life, and he decided science was for him. And as I said before, uh, science in nature was his dream. And what that led him to were discoveries that have changed the face of science in the, in, in the world. Um, and that is, I think, this, those are the sorts of stories that Americans need to see and hear, uh, because they are the kinds of things that inspire us to a knowledge of what we are capable of doing. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I think needs, bears a repeating about what um, George's conversation with Spencer Weirt was about was, if it becomes so in, uh, indefensibly uh, obvious in uh, the 2020s that climate change is creating a disaster, the problem with that is it may then be too late to stop it. We're not talking about something that we can turn off like that. This is, we're talking about climate systems that have been developing for years and that they are, uh, they, you know, as people continue to use the analogy of steering, a, turning a steamship in the, uh, in the ocean. One doesn't just sort of turn that thing about and the same is true with the climate. One doesn't simply just make it happen that suddenly it's going to be different. It's going to take a long time, and we are going to be reaping the whirlwind for a long time. So um, one of the beauties uh, for me, one of the most profound statements George makes in the play is something I'd like to uh, just read to you, if I may. And it's at the end of the story. It's the end of kind of what uh, Keeling des describes to you as the audience. And he says, I'll leave you with this. For 130,000 years, human beings, anatomically identical to us, with brains and native intelligence on a level with ours, lived on this planet. Lived under conditions very different from ours, but lived on this planet. One generation followed another, nothing ever changed. And then the climate changed. It warmed up. Sea levels rose. People came out of the caves. We entered the stable, relatively benign climate we've taken for granted for the past 10,000 years. Within 5,000 years, we had writing. The first cities sprang up. All the advances that characterize modern life and civilization came about, learning, science, the arts, medicine. The big new thing was the new climate, and it was stable. It has been remarkably uniquely stable for the past 8,000 years. It's the only climate we've known on the only planet we have. And we've had a civilized world because we've had a civilized, stable climate. And now we're losing it. I think that's something for all of us to take into serious consideration. We are on some levels ignorant of the reality that, that the world and the geosystem of which we are a part uh, presents us. It moves at its own pace, but we have been affecting it negatively since the dawn of the industrial age, and that is what the problem is. So with that, if I may, George and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have for the next little while. Just stay where you are. Thank you. Please raise your hands and let us get a mic to you. We're streaming this, of course. Uh, right there in the back, Jim. And uh, we want our viewers to be able to hear your question. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. I just wanted to share a couple things. Yesterday there was an event here at All Saints put on by the League of Women Voters. It had a panel of uh, climate experts. And I want to refer everyone to a study that was done by a young scientist named Daniel Walton. He did a study not just a broad study so you could see general trends, but something right here in Los Angeles in Pasadena. That business as usual, the number of hot days that we have per year here is roughly 23 a year in Pasadena. By 2050 without anything, that'll be double. By 2100, it'll be quadrupled. 
Even with mitigation, we're not going to lower those numbers. So it's an amazing study. I, I recommend everyone uh, look up the League of Women Voters for that information from yesterday. And then the other point I wanted to make um, is asking you about groups that you support that you feel are doing the most, uh, the best work right now in this area, and recommend that everyone here, um, it's not just good enough to come and hear about it, but to look into joining the local citizens' climate lobby here in Pasadena that's out of Caltech. Um, climate Resolve, Jonathan Parfrey was here yesterday, the amazing things they're doing in Los Angeles. The Cool Roof Ordinance, every new building has to have a cool roof on it. We can do that here in Pasadena with the City Council. We can make that happen. So I recommend everyone go out there, and if you can recommend good groups here, things we can do here and now in addition to coming to your, your show. Thank you. both for being here. I really appreciate the fact that you're here. And I just, I wanted to beg, I literally could get down on my hands and knees, but then you won't be able to see me. Please, please, please do something to turn this into a movie. Mm -hmm. Al Gore trekked all over the country and all over the world doing these amazing presentations. He reached thousands of people doing that. That movie came out, he reached millions of people in just a couple of months, so I beg you. We have an amazing audiovisual staff here. Maybe you can talk to Keith and get him involved with that. <laughs> and Mike, I know that you were involved with the most popular TV show in the entire history of the world, so maybe you still have some connections that could help with that, but I just, what you guys have to do is get that important message out there, and if you can use that medium to do it, we would love to help you in absolutely any way we can. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. That's, that's kind. And, and, and please don't think we're unaware of that. The problem with it is that it's expensive to do a show, and one has to have the elements that will make it worth the investment of, on somebody's part. So we're looking for that, and, and we are working hard at it. Um, in answer to your question, there are or good environmental organizations across the land doing extraordinary work. The Secretary of the Interior, I believe it was, who said, uh, here in California, the best thing people can do is paint their roofs white, paint their, the, the roof of their houses white so that it reflects rather than, than uh, absorbs uh, temperature. So there, there are any number of things we can do and should be doing, and, and listen to the people around you who are the experts. George might have another idea. Uh, 350.org is, is a very uh, active. Bill McKibben. Uh, I mean, the demonstrations that, that have been organized, McKibben has organized them. Uh, there were 40,000 people in Washington last year. It was the largest uh, environmental demonstration in American history. Uh, matter of fact, Tom Steyer, uh, who Mike's been talking about, spoke at that event. So I think we're eventually we're going to have to have massive demonstrations, like the civil rights era. Uh, that, that's one way things do get turned around. We're going to have to do it. 100,000 people. Um, Michael Brune, the head of the Sierra Club, said that, they, that he talks to McKibben all the time. So uh, when, when, they, when they march on Washington or whatever, uh, Please, as many of you as possible, be there. And I have only one, other, one question for the man in the green. What's your name? I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, <laughs> Daryl Park. Daryl Park. Is that right? Yeah. Great, Daryl. Thank He's you. He's got lots of money. Great. Great. <laughs> George, uh, George, I believe, has arranged or is working on arranging having the play we're doing on the 22nd at Caltech taped. Uh, videotaped, but we're not sure that'll be the right kind of thing that could be made into a DVD and, you know, having the necessary effect. Uh, could you help us understand the mindset of the folks who are denying climate change? And sure. what can be done to help them understand uh, their responsibility in doing something about it? Well, the, the people who oppose climate change in, the, in most instances are people who have been told to that it's poppycock, but it's the people who are selling that uh, point of view that one has to worry about because they know they're lying. The Heartland Institute, for example, is an organization that is paid great deals of uh, great amounts of money to put out in the media stories about uh, the debunking this whole idea of, of, uh, of climate change. And you know that global warming, nobody says global warming anymore because it's been, it's been made to look foolish when you have the ice storms in the Northeast. 
You've got people on Fox News getting up and saying, it's worry about global warming, my butt. Worry about global cooling, they're saying now. So the big problem, I think, is dishonesty. And I think all you can do about that is unmask it. The same people, and uh, I think uh, Joe Rahm pointed that out, the same people that told us that smoking wasn't harmful, the same people that told us that uh, smoking didn't bother your, you know, your lungs and your heart and all the things that it has caused to go into deterioration, are the people who are standing up today backed by mostly the, the um, petrochemical industry to say this is nonsense, don't listen to it. There's nothing. We have nothing to worry about. Look out there. The sun is shining. Um, so it, the, for me, the big, big issue is the dishonesty that has to be unmasked and, 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 uh, and made obvious. Over here. Please. I want to uh, thank you for your action orientation and then ask you to comment on some rather dispiriting news that's come out in the last uh, few weeks, which is that Germany, which has long been one of the kind of paragons of commitment to combating climate change and has doubled and quadrupled down on solar energy and wind energy, gotten away from nuclear energy, has just had its worst year for CO2 emissions since 1990. And the reason largely is that the country is now making up the gap in their energy supply with dirty coal because it's all they have. They don't have natural gas. They've shut down a bunch of nuclear reactors. The wind and solar haven't come on as quickly as they, they'd hoped. And so they've just had their dirtiest energy year in 25 years and also their most expensive. So it's hurting their economy as well. And it seems to me we're going to start to see more and more things like this, where as we take action, some will work and some won't. Um, and I, I wonder what you would say in response to that uh, once we've got the, the message to get moving, what we do when we start to run into some challenges of our own. Thoughts? Well, um, I know, I know uh, there was a huge anti-nuclear movement uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, a lot of scientists, uh, Spencer Weirts, one of them, uh, Jim Hansen's <laughs> another, think that uh, it might be a good idea to give nuclear a second chance. Uh, the technology is safer. It's a lot more advanced. It's not the, the same storage problem there was earlier. I don't know. But the, the thing about nuclear is it is very powerful. It, it could, and it's a shame the Germans uh, took that action uh, because the Germans have been doing a great job. Uh, uh, they have a lot of solar over there, and that's a country that's, it's not Florida, you know. It's a, uh, but I mean, obviously, if, if they're going to try more nuclear, you can't build it on sea coasts where you could have tsunamis or whatever. You can't build it on earthquake faults. You've got to be very careful. But uh, there never has been a human fatality in this country uh, from nuclear, so I don't know. I, I'm sure there, there are other, other people who feel very strongly the other way, but there is an argument for it. Right here? It's an area where we disagree, I should say. <laughs> uh, as long as you can have, have a system that creates poison that you can't sufficiently deal with, it seems to me we've got to find alternatives. But. Um, the question then becomes the devil you know and the devil you don't, and how you make those choices. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, just a couple of quick points. 10% uh, of California's air pollution comes from China now. It crosses the Pacific. Uh, so it's becoming a transnational issue as much as Europe is experiencing the same thing. So we're not immune to China and they can hardly breathe in Beijing. I mean, look at the pictures. But uh, your point about uh, perhaps your children's book isn't uh, the right way to go, I, I kind of beg to differ with that. I, I look at the kids in, in this parish, just in church, as they run up to go to Sunday school and come back so joyous and everything. They're the ones who are going to bear the brunt. They're the ones who are not going to see the beauty in nature that we have grown up with. Yeah, I, I'm from the South. I see it already in Florida. It's just overbuilt and uh, many problems. But it's not the same place where I grew up. And this won't be the same place where they grow up either. So uh, you might want to revisit the children's book idea. Yeah, Claire I Martin. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I want to second his comment about the children's book because we have a child in sixth grade 
And we are constantly having to debunk his science teacher's comments about global warming being bunk. So I think if you write the books, then you will give our children the tools that they need to debunk what the adults are telling them. Yeah, I'm Glenn Orton. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I wanted to second Daryl's comment about the ability of motion pictures to do this sort of thing. I don't have a lot of money. I have a lot of data. <laughs> um, and I don't, my, my wife works as a molecular spectroscopist helping the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 coming up that actually will give more information about where the carbon cycle is going and all of that sort of thing. We do, um, and we do have examples of planets which have gone awry. If you want to go to Venus or Mars, you can see two of the endpoints that the Earth might fall into as well. Um, climate change instead of global warming isn't, isn't a choice of making something uh, more palatable. It's the fact that there are things that are changing. It's actually a, a term used by climatologists, and we want to emphasize that. It is not just things that are warming. It's lots and lots of stuff that's going to change as a result. Uh, and finally, it's really nice, besides the movie idea, to see lots more plays and media about people in science, like me and my wife. Um, <laughs> Uh, including, what was it, three years ago at Boston Court, we had Sequence uh, playing at the Lamely is, is uh, Particle Fever. Just understanding the monumental things that are taking place, the human genome, the, the God particle, the Higgs boson, coming in and, and the personalities of the people, like us who are as humans, and just striving to try to get that done, despite all the huge obstacles about funding, uh, especially about things that are not even politically uh, tainted, uh, corrupted uh, in some sense. Um, it's always a challenge to me to find out what the, how you change people's mind when they ask me, do you believe in global warming? And I say, no, here's a graph. <laughs> you don't need to believe in anything. You just get a straight line and it's going through the roof. What is, what's the obvious thing? And it's like, uh, so I don't know how to answer that except with more data, except that they've already been convinced uh, that anything not in their mind, my best, one of the friends I see doing that and what you, don't you like about global warming? And he says, cap and trade. So it's the whole, it's, it's another mindset. I'd like to thank the uh, people who were, <coughs> Just hello, who more. were underlining, underlying, underlining the importance of um, the message to the children who are going to inherit this mess we've made. And in view of, um, of course, we're visual culture, but you know the astounding amounts of money that it may take to do that. What's on my mind is rap music for the young people. Mm. Something that would be singable, get into the, the lexicon, or whatever I need to be saying there. I think you get my drift. Uh, wherever the young people are, I think that's what we need to, um, well, that's one possibility. And I think it would be less expensive than a film. I don't know about money. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a rapper, but it would be a great idea. <laughs> if we can find somebody to do a rap song, I think you're quite right. This would be a fabulous way to get through to people. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And that could lead into a YouTube video instead of a major motion picture, YouTube. It gets to everybody and have something to introduce it like a cool rap song or rapper saying, hey, y'all watch this. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, hi, I'm just, I'm just curious, is the, the air pollution that's already here, is, it, is there a way to actually clean it up or, is there a way, or does it just like stay there? Um, yeah. Well, there, you, you got, you, you, there, there are a couple of issues. Air pollution is a big issue, and it's because of inversion layers and that sort of thing. But to the degree that it's made up by CO2 particles, what I didn't know before doing this play is that CO2 that is created today, CO2 that was created 500 years ago is still in our atmosphere. And that is creating problems. And every particle of CO2 that we continue to, to create and send out into the atmosphere will be there for hundreds of years. So that is creating a huge uh, blanket that is essentially what is 
they, what they call the cause of global warming. Um, there are other issues, of course, with regard to our pollution, our polluted atmosphere, but the, that's, that's a significant part of it. Um, I'm curious where you would, I'm over here, um, I'm curious where you would weigh in on desalination. We hear about the heat that's produced, the um, effect on the global um, ecosystem of the ocean, um, and yet we have all the news of a drought and this limitless supply. Where, um, where do you weigh in on that? Go ahead. Uh, des it, it's very energy intensive, desalinization, so um, obviously, it'd be great if they could improve the technology. I was talking to Wally Broker, who, invent, who sort of coined the term global warming back in 1975. He's in his 80s now. But he said it's, uh, the droughts are going to be terrible. He said the Middle East is really going to get sucked. Uh, I think the Israelis get a lot of their water right now uh, by desalinization. So that's... Yeah. And, and, and one of the impacts of... Global warming, one of the impacts of climate change is going to be the result of uh, torrential rains in areas that haven't had it in the past, causing flooding, and droughts in areas that have, are used to having it or are used to living on a spare amount of it. Uh, snow melt is less, so the water runoff will be less. There, there are these inter, interacting uh, aspects of the, of the climate that we hadn't thought of before. Um, I'm, you know, desalinization has been held out as a big uh, possibility for a lot of people, but they're finding that it has, as you've suggested, a significant problems attached to it. The same as nuclear energy, the same as all these other choices. We really have to make some big decisions, I think, in the, in the near future. And some of these things may be stopgap measures that are taken in order to alleviate one problem by creating another that can hopefully be dealt with after that by creating something that will deal with that one. I always hate to interrupt a great conversation, and it, our time is over. Please let's all show up on April 22nd at Caltech, and we'll have these guys back to have some more conversation. Thank you very much, George and Mike. <laughs>